Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned, we're just one week away from the giant warm intro. Um, and as a reminder, you know, the giant warm intro really exists to create a warm introduction um, where early in your journey, you can ask for advice, test your pitch and create great connections. Um, the stats show that a giant warm intro really can help you with meeting, getting a meeting with a VC and does increase the likelihood of investment. So we hope this is a great first step on your path to funding. Um, as I mentioned, we're excited. This is the third year that Rampersan has been bringing the giant warm intro to you. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Taryn Petersey. I'm an investment principal at Rampersand. Um, we're a VC fund investing in early stage technology businesses just like yourselves. Um, and our aim is to support founders with more than just money. Um, we couldn't possibly run the giant warm intro without our wonderful sponsor, AWS, and supporters like Cake Equity, um, as well as the wonderful VC funds and angels you'll be meeting as part of the event. I'm super grateful to have Mark from AWS, Rach, um, a founding partner of Flying Fox, and Jason, the co-founder of Cake Equity here, to help prepare you to meet with investors on the day. Um, I might kick over to you first, Rachel, um, to do, do a quick introduction of yourself. Hi, everyone. And um, it's so awesome to see so many folks being part of this program. As Taryn said, I've been involved for a few years, and it's just so cool to see how it just keeps getting more and more um, people uh, to put up their hands and do something really brave, which is, um, you know, put yourself out there, especially when it's early and you might just be started and um, get us, you know, give us the chance to get to know you um, and just know, like, we are super excited to meet all of you. So can't wait for it. Um, so as uh, Taryn mentioned, I'm Rachel. I'm one of the founding partners of Flying Fox Ventures. We're an early stage investment firm. Um, we write checks into super for early companies. Um, some of you guys on the call might fit the bill. Um, we have a portfolio of about 44 companies and we've done about 57 investments around $20 million um, deployed to date. And um, we were a bit different in that we have lots of investors um, and we are strategically matching them up with our founders so that they have great mentorship uh, through the early stage of their journey. But uh, that's a bit about me. And I'll tell you in a little bit um, what we investors think and how we think to uh, set you guys up for success. So over Thanks, to you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, passing it over to you, Mark. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, Mark Smarsley from AWS. I work in the startups team as a business development manager. Most of my work is working with about probably 50 venture capital funds, mostly in Australia and their portfolio of companies. Most of my work involves either, I think I always say like, you know, founder to founder introductions, founder to investor introductions, or founder to customer introductions, usually at scale. Uh, previous to joining AWS, I've been here two and a half years, but I was a fintech founder for seven and a half years, originally from the States and came over to Australia about five years ago. So lovely to be here. So excited to see so many founders here. Uh, and can't wait to help out with talking a little bit more about um, who are you going to meet and how to prepare for that meeting. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Jace. Thanks, Taryn. Um, yeah, so I'm Jason. I'm one of the co-founders of Cake. Uh, at Cake, we're committed to helping startups uh, create value from their equity. So that'll include capital raising, equity plans, and you know other cap table related things. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've you know, helped thousands of startups through a lot of these early stage equity issues. Uh, myself personally, I've run a bunch of rounds. I've been in your situation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I come from a position of, I guess, a founder and also an advisor and mentor, um, you know, to startups. Um, pretty constantly um, over the last few years, been studying and, and researching and mentoring in this space. So really happy to be here today and help um, highlight some of the best questions to ask to help um, today, but also throughout your raise. Awesome. Thanks, Jace. Um, and yeah, as part of the giant warm intro, we do have 145 investors who you guys will be being paired with. Um, so they literally have been throwing ourselves at you. As Rach said, everyone's super excited um, to meet early stage investors and help you early in your journey. Um, so I think what we just want to do today is help you prepare for that session, make sure you know you, you know what you're um, up for and a little bit about what to expect, but also just you know make it really clear that it's a, a warm introduction. Everyone's here to be helpful um, and, and you know, provide you with great feedback. So it's not a super scary event. Um, it's supposed to be 
a lovely warm introduction. Um, I'm going to do some super boring logistics for the actual event because it's a little bit different. It's not your standard Zoom call. Um, we will be using a platform called AirMeet, um, which we recommend that you join from your laptop um, and launch through Google Chrome. This is for next week, just to clarify, um, for the giant warm intro. And what we're going to do is we'll match you with for two 30 minute back to back sessions with two different investors, either between 3 and 4 p.m. or 4 to 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And you'll find about all about your allocations of your timing, which investor you've been paired with, the AirMeet link, everything you could possibly want to know and more. Um, we'll be coming to your inbox on Monday from Alicia. So just look out for your emails, which you've obviously all been receiving to be able to sign up for this session. Um, I just recommend you log in kind of five minutes early to AirMeet if you've not used it before. Quick registration. You then maneuver over to the social lounge where it just looks like a big convention room with a heap of tables. Um, and you just, yeah, kind of scroll through, find which investor you've been matched with that you would receive in your emails um, and sit down. And then it does effectively look like Zoom after that. You'll be notified when um, your 30 minutes is up and to move on to your next investor. Um, and then after that hour, you will be done. Um, if you want to bring your co-founder along to the event, feel free. Um, effectively, I think each table has um, four seats to it. So there'll be an investor and there's probably space for you and, and two of your other co-founders to join. Or if you're joining from the same computer, you can have as many of your co-founders as you want. As you want. Um, the more the merrier. Um, but yeah, maximum, more than Mary, but maximum three. <laughs> um, awesome. So that's, yeah, that's the, the boring logistics for the event. Just wanted to flag it because it is a bit different. Um, but the main thing to, to know is it's all going to be in your inbox from Alicia on Monday. Um, that is the key point. Um, and if you do have tech problems in the day, Alicia and I are tech support um, and we'll be at table one. Um, uh, something much, much more exciting is if you are a Sydney-based founder, um, AWS, Cake and Airwallex are running an in-person event for founders on the evening after the event on the 17th of August. Um, so if you are interested in attending, the registration link will be in the chat. Thank you, Emmy. Amazing. Um, so that'll be a fun night to all chat about your and share your experiences from the giant warm intro. Um, that is all I have to say about my logistics and ramble. Um, Mark, I'll just chuck it over to you now so you can give us a, a bit of an introduction of the best way to prepare founders for their goals for the session. Thank you. Awesome. Can everybody see my slide? Fantastic. Excellent. So yeah, I get uh, 10 minutes to talk about who you are meeting. I don't necessarily know who you are meeting, but I do know how to help you prepare for that and get the most out of your meeting. So um, I mentioned before, uh, so I'm a former fintech founder. I did the journey for seven years. Um, and so not everyone you're going to meet, not all the investors have gone on that fintech journey or excuse me, the founder journey. Um, but I'm here to basically put myself, you know, like I remember what it was like to pitch my very first investor to go back even when I had an idea on a napkin and had no clue what to do. Um, and what you'll find with the warm intro or kind of anybody that you meet is that your job as a founder is to attract resources to you. Everyone you meet could potentially open up a door or an opportunity to you. And that's how I always viewed like almost everything. Not you're always pitching to like sell something because I think people always think sales is kind of sleazy. But you you have conviction in your idea. You wouldn't be doing this if you didn't believe it in your heart and your soul and you didn't want to spend the next 10 years. So when you're out there doing these meetings, my goal is to basically help you kind of help the person on the other side of the fence understand your conviction, understand your ask, and then clearly kind of open up doors for you to, to bring you into their circle and supply more resources uh, to your journey. So with that, I've got basically one slide here with some ideas. And I think most everybody probably... If you've been in any industry or you've gotten your, your idea to this point, obviously, you know, you're not you're not starting at zero. You've got some idea on what you're doing, hopefully. Um, and you probably know some of the stuff. So I'm trying to give you some ideas that are kind of a little outside the box that'll really help you kind of differentiate yourself. And there's, you know, almost 200 of you on here. So um, it's really about differentiating you from everyone else that founder or that investor is going to meet over the next year. Because the percentage of people that they actually fund or bring into to, to the resource party is very small. So you really do have to stand out. And it's not always just about your idea or the size of the market. It really is a lot of time about you as the founder. So first thing is um, something that, you know, at Amazon we call, you know, working backwards or kind of beginning with the end in mind. With your meeting, and you have two meetings. So one, you could be ready to pitch right now. You could be actively pitching. 
you could have half your round filled. So this is an opportunity for you to help it close the rest of that round or get a, a new lead investor or get your lead investor, et cetera. Some of you might just be looking for advice or intro to another key person, maybe an advisor, but you really do need to begin each of these meetings with knowing what your goal is for that, because you have to have a clear ask at the end. But if you don't know, again, why you're meeting with this person at the front side, they are going to be kind of like, in many ways, confused early on as to what this particular thing is. So setting the table for that, Rachel probably will talk about it a little bit in, in crafting a pitch, but you want to be kind of crystal clear early on too, and not just going right into a pitch, but hey, I am so excited to meet with you, you know, Taryn, I love Rampersand for this, that, and the other reason. I'm so excited for this. At the end of this call, I'd really like to, you know, maybe get your top two people that we should connect with because we sell into enterprise customers and B2B, and I know that you have this X, Y, and Z in your portfolio. So I almost even set the conversation up like that kind of directly to, to let the person know what you're looking to get out of it. Um, Second thing is, and this is like in anything sales wise, if you're a founder, you are the first salesperson, by the way, if you don't know this, the first 100K to 1 million is entirely going to be pretty much on your back. Um, and sales is a lot of time pre-prep is a huge part of sales. So researching the individual or the fund that you're looking for, um, LinkedIn would be just basic table stakes. Um, but you really want to go back and look, you know, where has this person come from, articles that they've written. Um, even when you could, where they went to school, have they founded another um, company in the past? Twitter is a great place, especially for investors to really talk about their thesis and what they're seeing and what their ideas are. And it's very, very timely and relevant typically too. But anywhere online to get resources, um, I would advise you to be really um, overly aggressive on that. And I say, I love quotes in that um, I've, when I used to pitch into banks and credit unions, I would look through annual reports for, for things that the, the CEO said and within my context of my presentation, I'd put in there, you know, a, a quote saying, you know, the path of digital transformation is, you know, solutions that put the customer first. And I, I, you know, would put that into my presentation and say, I believe this. You, Amy, the CEO, I know you believe this because this is from your 2022 annual report. So we're on the same wavelength here. It really shows that you've done your homework, but also it's giving them a voice as to why they should be helping you. So I love that kind of idea there. Um, again, relevant intro to the fund and individual um, is that if you've gotten matched with somebody, hopefully it's because you kind of self-selected, like I would like to meet with this investor. So tell them why, what is it about? Is it their thesis? Is it their stage? Is it that they back, you know, three of your most favorite startups that you use personally? Telling them a little bit about why they are a good fit for that meeting or why you selected them is a great way to obviously open the conversation. Fourth bullet there, FAQs, frequently asked questions. Um, as a founder, how you do anything, even like a 30-minute meeting, is, is in my mind, as an investor, how you do everything. So having the preparation to know what are the most frequently asked questions that will typically come up of any founder, especially a founder in your industry, and knowing some of those answers. Um, in sales, we called it, you know, Mary had a little lamb. When you hear Mary had a little, you can't help but say lamb. So with some of these frequently asked questions, like, you know, why is your team going to be the, the best one to take this idea to market? I am so glad you asked that, you know, and then you have, you have a comments prepared. It's not a canned memorized response, but you need to have succinct bullets on these types of questions that you know will come up from any investor. Um, don't waste time on like exit strategy, total addressable markets and things like that are kind of good. But um, it, to me, it's really more about why the timing, why you, the founder, why your founding team, um, how you came up with the idea. Is it a personal problem? But I, I had a list of about at least 40 frequently asked questions or questions I anticipated and had my responses. This is why I was formally pitching, um, not so much early on, but I had answers to those questions because it shows your level of preparation. At the end of that meeting, you want your investor to be like, wow, this founder, if she is this prepared for this, I cannot imagine her not succeeding in what she's doing. That's the kind of thing at the end of the day, that sort of level of preparation is just phenomenal. So um, if asking for advice, so the, the fifth bullet down here, if asking for advice, show that you've done some work. So sometimes I'll have a startup say, how do I find a tech founder? So then it's like, okay, there's, there's lots of articles about that. Like, how do you find a tech founder? What I'd say is, you know, so one of the biggest challenges I know I have is I've gotten myself this far with low code, no code, or I've got an MVP version out from a consulting company. I know I need to attract the tech founder. So I've joined the local meetups. I've done this. I've done that. 
but do you have any ideas, some outside the box things that you've, you've seen other founders do to attract a technical co-founder? Show that you've actually researched this idea. If you're asking for help and you, and you haven't done any research on the question you're asking, in my mind, as somebody who's hopefully going to give you resources, I'm like, why haven't they done the basic 101 of this question? So if you're asking a question, talk a little bit about what you know about that question or what you've seen for stuff, but you're asking this person for their advice because they've got a deeper domain expertise on that question, but don't just put it out there as if you've done, not done any research. It just really sets you up as looking like you don't even care enough to do the basic table stakes, right? And then the last two here, a great way to close a meeting. So, and, and don't go over your time, always respect your time. If you have a two minute pitch, you nail it at 158. If you have a seven minute pitch, you nail it at 658, right? So if you have a 30 minute meeting, you need to be prepared to watch that clock. And at 27 minutes, I would be like, hey, you know, we've covered pretty much everything I have right now. But the one last thing I really wanna ask you is, I know you know a lot of investors if you're looking for investment, or I know you have a lot of advisors who've got e-commerce experience. Who else should I meet with? Can you, at the end of this, give me two names of people I need to meet with to, to learn from or to connect with or as potential investors? Because then you've taken this one meeting and you've exponentially amplified it into two new opportunities, right? And those two new opportunities, ask them, who are the other two people I need to meet at the end of that? So then you've got an exponential. This two intros gets you four. The four gets you, what, eight? The eight gets you 16. It's just two X all the way through there. And this is a long game. Your deal is not to close, you know, 100, 200, 500,000 in this 30 minute meeting. It's to get the next meeting. If you're making a new introduction to an investor and you're not ready for investment or they pass for now, it's to then start giving them quarterly updates or monthly updates. It's to nurture that relationship for the time when you do need them. It's a, it's a long game in that you're playing the relationship game and that's not first date, I need half a million dollars. <laughs> are you in or are you out? Uh, the long game is, I'm the kind of founder that you're going to back multiple times. I, I, and this is why we're meeting now. To me, that's, that's, that's my best advice for everybody here. All right. Any, and Mark, you absolutely yeah. nailed the timing, um, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, I think like that was super helpful, Mark. And you know, for, for those of you who, this is literally your first meeting with an investor, even just start writing down the questions they do ask you, because you'll tend to find that um, if you don't have your full list yet, what one investor asks you about is, is what the next investor might ask you about as well. And then it might actually be something that you, you know, start preemptively um, addressing or including in your elevator pitch. Um, so I guess to, to, you know, regardless of what you do want to get out of your meeting, if it is pitch advice, if it's just, you know, general feedback, um, definitely the best way to kick off your meeting is with a super crisp, super to time um, elevator pitch. Um, and I'll pass over to Rach, um, who will give you some advice on how to prepare your elevator pitch. Great. Thank you. And um, Mark, thank you so for um, teeing up my talk uh, very nicely as well. Um, everything Mark said, especially around that preparation, um, really means so much because it just means that we can both sides, and ideally your investor or the advisor, the person on the other side of the table, I always try my best to do my homework and pre-work as well. And you can imagine if we've both done our pre-work, we can just use that 30 minutes so effectively and get to the real heart of the matter without spending time asking kind of those very basic um, get to know you questions. Um, I want to just say what I love about the giant warm intro is that this is using a 30 minute block of time. And as an investor, that is absolutely the unit of time that I use to meet founders for the first time. So this is a great proxy for what it's going to look like if we were um, you know, having a chat about whether Flying Fox um, and your company were a good fit, this is what it would look like. And so because of that, many investors, we use the 30 minute meeting, um, we kind of have it down to a science. We have it down to a bit of a formula. Um, you know, as Mark said, keep to time. I know what 30 minutes feels like in my body. Um, and so what it means is that, again, we're running to a little bit of this internal clock. And I'm going to show you uh, what that internal clock is and what that internal um, uh, thinking pattern is for us investors so you can get into our heads. And then from that, I will help you build out what a great pitch looks like for you. 
So I'm just going to share some slides. Um, I'm doing a similar workshop for the Mindaroo Foundation next week, and I have pulled some slides together for them. So that's why the Wade logo um, is in it. But I want to first tell you what we investors look for, because if you know what's in our head, then you can help to craft your conversation to meet our needs or to give us the information we need to really get to know you. Um, so first of all, you should know that, you know, we get deal flow from a number of sources. This is one of those where, you know, it's a giant warm intro or it might be a pitch contest, might be inbound, outbound, cold, et cetera. So just know that we're getting lots of different companies in at all times. And just so you know what that funnel looks like, I meet about a thousand companies a year and I talk to about 100 in a more deep and meaningful way, and I invest in about 10 to 15. So that's what it looks like. And I'm not saying that to scare you, but I'm saying that so that you understand what a typical investor is getting in, term of, in terms of her or his workload, which shows why that first meeting or that pitch has to be so high impact, because it's mathematically, you have to increase your chances of going from 1,000 to 100 to 10. Now, here's just a framework that you can use, and I'm going to just show two frameworks very quickly. And this is just giving you an idea of the types of things that we are looking for. And I will go into depth uh, in all of these later, and also I'll make these slides available. I'll do some screenshots, throw them in the chat, um, or um, we can distribute them in some way. So don't feel like you need to scribble. Or, um, But first and foremost, we are looking at understanding the customer problem. Um, and we want to know um, why does that customer problem matter, right? So like really help us to articulate the deep customer insight and empathy that you are expressing and why it needs to be solved. Then, of course, we want to know the solution. We want to know what is it that you're building. We want to understand is this problem in a huge and growing market? And so we'll want to understand that quantitatively, how big is this opportunity? Um, maybe at this point in early stage, we don't necessarily always have a business model, but it'll be helpful if you do have a business model and that is your unique innovation, then tell us what that business model is. Then we'll, you know, we're looking at trends, like why now? Um, for example, today I was uh, reviewing a company with Kylie, my investment partner, and she said, you know, haven't lots of companies try this? Why would it work now? And I was like, GPT-3, like all of a sudden, there was a new AI engine that meant that something that was really hard could be really powerful now, right? So help us to understand why is the timing right now? Um, and then most important, especially early stage, it's about you and your team. And we want to know why you are absolute superstars. And for all the people who might be working on this problem, why are we going to back you and your co-founders to do it? So this is one framework. Another way that you might see it expressed is the six T's, which is basically the same thing, the team, the TAM, the tech. Here we're talking about traction. So again, it's not necessary that you, you know, have a hundred thousand dollars in, uh, you know, monthly recurring revenue off the bat. But if you have users and those users are loving your product, they're showing habituation, then you want to tell us that. We're looking for signals that customers really feel this pain and they're willing to adopt a solution to fix it. And so any evidence that you have around traction is really helpful. The only one that wasn't in the last uh, framework that I put here is in the six T's as terms. And that is actually when we're getting closer to the deal, just does it make sense? And we, we won't talk about deal mechanics now, but that's around, is the valuation right? Um, you know, are the other parties coming to the table, you know, the right group? But um, that's something that we, you can um, get excited to worry about down the track. These are just two models that you could very easily Google. Um, and again, I'll make those available. But this is just helpful to know what auto, like on autopilot, what are we investors thinking through? Now, I mentioned the team is really important. And this is actually a study that was done where I looked at a bunch of investors and they said, what actually are you over indexing towards? And you can see 50% of VCs when they rated their most important attribute, it's around team. Um, and this is ever more important in the early stage, because in the early stage, there might not be a product yet. There might not be a business model. Um, surely we have an industry and a market, um, but that management team is so much of what is driving that decision. So don't be afraid to show us who you are and who you are authentically and what brings you to this problem to wake up and go to sleep every day and every night obsessing over this problem. That is the magic um, that brings us together. So don't be afraid um, to show us who you are because 50% of our decision-making is around the jockey rather than the horse. So around you, the person, rather than the business. 
Also, just one note here, when I'm looking at a product or a solution in this early stage, very rarely do I think to myself, this is the product that's going to change the world and make us money. Instead, I think this is the team that has the ability to figure it out. And in fact, that product is probably going to change many times over. But does this team have the smarts, the attitude, the network, the ability to process information, to learn from their customers? Those are the types of attributes that we're looking for. Now, the one thing I'll just note here is the real problem with VCs or investors is that we're humans and humans have a ton of biases. This is just a sample of some of the biases that we know today. Now, good investors are trying to um, overcome these biases in many ways, but we have to acknowledge that many of us have these. Um, and so uh, this is just a, a moment to remember that we, at this point, aren't robots. Um, we're all humans uh, and we make mistakes and we are prone to these biases. Um, but I'll tell you all of the investors that we've invited into the um, giant warm intro, we have talked extensively about these biases. How do we overcome them? And what structures do we put in place in our teams and in our processes to make sure um, that we are doing our best to um, be aware of and mitigate some of these biases? But I just want, want to acknowledge that they absolutely continue to exist. All right, so what are you gonna do to shine? How do we increase your odds of getting funded? Mark said preparation, right? Prep, prep, prep. And when you prepare, um, it is a mix of knowing who you're going in to talk to. It's anticipating what are the questions that she or he are likely to ask. And it's making sure that you have deeply thought about the answers. And sometimes the best answer is, I don't know. And here are the things I'm going to do to find out. So don't be, a, what we're not, we're not looking for you to have all the answers. We're looking for you to have be, been thoughtful about the likely questions. So just know we're going to, you know, you're going to prepare. We're going to have this conversation and then there'll be an expectation. Um, Jason will talk about kind of what happens with feedback after, um, after you meet an investor. So first of all, do your homework. Mark had talked about doing individual homework, but also just, just know who the investors are out here. And this is just a real, uh, handful of companies. It's not exhaustive at all. But just know that there are lots of different funding groups. There are platforms and syndicates and funds and people like Flying Fox who kind of look like a syndicate and kind of look like a fund. Just do some homework to understand who is who is out there and who might have the right structure for the stage and the company um, like yours. So a little bit of homework of who are your likely targets. And in this next slide, Again, it kind of clusters a handful of companies based on stage, but there's lots of information out there. Um, there's an open source uh, spreadsheet that Airtree has put out that has a bunch of angels as well as a bunch of funds. Um, get your hands on these resources so you aren't, you know, talking to uh, a private equity fund that only handles, you know, S Series C and on about your pre-seed idea. Likewise. It's a waste of time as if someone is raising $100 million and is talking to Flying Fox, where our average check size is 500K. So just know who's who. Now, the first thing I talked about, which is understanding the customer, we, wanted, we want to see that you deeply understand that customer need. And one way in which you can help us to understand that is don't talk about the solution, talk about the pain point. Help us to understand what is this problem. So here's an example where these, you, you can say, there are 500 customers, you know, in Victoria that need a Band-Aid right now. Another way to say it is there are 500 customers in Victoria that have bleeding that needs to stop. And when we understand the problem, it actually leaves us degrees of flexibility for solutions because then you could be a Band-Aid company, you can be a bleeding prevention company, you can be a gauze wrap company. But we can understand actually what is the problem when you speak in terms of the pain that the customer is feeling. Because again, you might be in love with your solution, but we already know or think that you're going to change that solution. So instead, tell us about the pain point. That's the thing that's going to be enduring. And that's what we will get really excited about when that pain, I mean, we sound like masochists, but we get excited about pain that is real, that is um, happening to lots of people in lots of different markets. So just get really good about talking about the pain point. There, and this won't be for everyone at every stage, but where you can use numbers, it really helps. So I have a joke that I say, you know, in God we trust, I'm not religious at all, but in God we trust, all else, everyone else has to bring data. 
And so that just means where you can quantify something for us. So if you were talking about, you know, bleeding knees are a major problem, lots and lots of people experience it. Quantify that for me. Tell me, 10% of people have a bleeding knee, you know, one at least once a, once a week. Um, that, it, that equates to, you know, 100,000 bleeding knees in Victoria alone, right? Give me some numbers. Now, I doesn't, I, I, I'm smart enough to, to say, you know, these guys aren't going to fix 100,000 bleeding knees right off the bat, but it gives me an idea of how big this opportunity is. The same thing, you know, if you have revenue, we like to see that expressed as monthly recurring revenue, if it's a recurring business or ARR. Um, if it is a product, then we're looking at unit economics, which means how much does it cost to get that customer and how much are you getting from that customer? Um, so that's kind of a CAC or an LTV. Just familiarize with yourself with some of these metrics. And if they are relevant to your business at this time, get some numbers ready. So if you have a product that hasn't hit market yet, just be aware that what we care about is unit economics. Talk about why you believe that when you go to market, you will have an advantage of a low acquisition cost and you think that they'll be around for a long time as a customer. Again, if you just understand the language and the vernacular that we use every day in terms of metrics and you're able to speak our language, it helps, um, helps us to connect more quickly. Here's a cheat sheet of what I ask and what it really means. All right. And so this is a killer slide that I have never shared before. So you get to see. Oh, it. I want this. Oh, <laughs> that's screenshotting. There you go. <laughs> um, and so this is exactly how a 30 minute call will go with me. And I think many, many investors will follow a similar format. But I start out by saying you could be working on anything. Why do you wake up every morning and work on this? What I really want to know is you. And what I want to I what I don't want is for you to tell me, oh, I was born in a small town and then I went to uni. Keep it short and sweet and keep it highly relevant to why you have decided to solve this problem. I'm looking at why are you passionate and then what is your direct experience with it? You know, um, I was a uni student and then all of us, you know, my parents um, had a major injury. We lost all our money. I couldn't continue school and I had to take care of them. That's when, where I knew that financial safety nets were critically important. Like, wow, like that is a really important insight for me to understand your motivation for why you're working on financial safety nets for, for people, right? So what I, this answer is a trick question because I want it to be short and sweet. I don't want the timeline of your life I want to know about your passion and your purpose. Why and why are you uniquely positioned to to work on this problem? Then I say, tell me about what your customer is doing today and why is it insufficient. I want to know about the pain point again, that problem, and why is it insufficient. That's what I want to know is why is your solution different than what is currently available in terms of competitors, or are you doing something that's ten x better than what they're doing today? And that the second question, you know, I might say there are others tackling this. Why are you different? That's for you to tell me about your differentiation and what is your value prop that is unique and defensible. Then I say, tell me about the progress. So the trick is that I will ask very casual questions, but they are very direct. Tell me about the progress you've made to date. Remember that T traction? That's just what I want to know. What have you done? And what I'm looking for is velocity. I'm looking for are these incredible executors that in a short amount of time can make really amazing progress and they can communicate that progress in terms of numbers or in terms of customer experience or customer love. So show me about progress. Then when I say, hey, how big can this be? I'm looking for TAM. What is the total dressable market? Because I'm not here. And again, not at first, I should have started. I always start by saying not every company is VC uh, appropriate. And that's because like, it's just not a good fit. But if you do want VC money, you should know that we're looking for big freaking companies that have the opportunity to be really, really, really big companies. So show us how big this can be. And here's a great place for you to flex that number power without you having to have internal data. This is usually external data. So do research on the market in which you're operating and come to us with that data. Then I would say, tell me about your co-founders. How did you meet? How do you divvy up roles and responsibilities? I'm looking for team dynamics and how have you thought about the lane, the power lanes, um, both in using your best uh, skills. Are they, you know, how do they complement? And have you been thoughtful about kind of the chunks of work that need to be done? 
Um, then I say, thinking about the year ahead, what's keeping you up at night? Here, I'm actually looking for you to have both the humility and the foresight to say, this is going to be a hard freaking road. There is not one chance. I don't invest in early stage companies because they're perfect. I invest in them because they're pimply and because I think we're going to turn them into beautiful, you know, hotties down the track. And so what I don't want is a company free of risk. I want a company that is cognizant of the risk and that risk is something that we can get through together. So this is where I want you to be as honest and authentic and as humble as possible to say, I'm really scared about this competitor. They're formidable, which means we're going to have to work twice as hard on X, Y, and Z. Or, you know, this will all come down to customer acquisition. Um, and right now that's at $5 CAC and my job is going to be obsessing to get it down to 250, right? So let's be really honest around what the big challenges are because the good news might be that the challenge you have might be the thing that the, that my team and I can really help you with. Um, tell me about the raise. That's where I'm just looking for the terms. That's where I want to know, is there a lead? How much are you raising? So be prepared to have some of those that, that data ready. And then what are your use of funds? What I'm looking at is how are you thinking about the next 12 months? And is the money you're raising going to get you to those milestones we need you to get to be an awesome company um, to attract further capital down the track? So that was a lot in that last slide. Um, but I'm happy to um, answer any questions later. Or uh, did you want to do Q&A now, Taryn, or after Jason? Um, maybe let's do it after Jace, um, if that's all right, Rach. So yeah, please, everyone, if you do have some questions for Rach, Jace, or Mark, put them in the Q&A section, I think would be helpful. The chat section's um, very active, which we love. Um, but the Q&A section will help us filter um, the, the questions part. So please do drop them in there and we'll have a few minutes at the end to chat through. Um, but thank you, Rachel, so much for that. That was absolute gold. Um, I'm sure everyone took plenty of notes and, and we'll share the link so you can, they can re-watch this as well um, in preparation for what they should be thinking about and preparing for um, to chat with their investors. Um, Jace, if people's, you know, mission for the Giant Warming Co is just to ask some, you know, feedback from investors on particular topics or um, you know, some pointy questions to investors if they want to understand how people, a bit more about what Rachel talking about, like, am I a VC fundable business or should I bootstrap or, you know, look for other, other talk types of funding? What is your advice um, for everyone on how to ask great questions and great, great feedback? Yeah, thanks, Darren. Um, yeah, really happy to be able to share some insights. I've, um, I've seen a lot of raises, they all seem to go differently, um, but I have I've learned a lot, um, you know, from raising myself, being part of accelerators, getting mentored, you know, by by people like Rachel. And um, so I'll try and share what I could. What I was thinking about for this section is, you know, what are the questions that I've seen founders struggle with? Uh, what are the most valuable questions that I've seen founders ask that can really unlock a great relationship or unlock and progress their round? Um, so yeah, let's jump into it and um, and see what we can what we can cover. So. First of all, um, it's a little bit of a simple one. Also, I just wanted to say this isn't specifically for this call. This first one's like some founders don't know how to actually ask investors to invest, you know, and you do need to actually ask that question. But I do want to caveat it's not necessarily what you want to do at the giant bomb intro, as Mark said, if you're flying through your round and you're getting towards the end and it's closing and everything perfectly, you can probably pitch in that circumstance and, you know, get some participation, which is wonderful. And we're all at different stages, I presume. Um, but for a lot of you, that's not going to be for this call, but it is very important. And especially very early on, it can be very challenging to ask that question. And how do you even ask it? Um, also on another one of Mark's points, one thing, one thing I do to keep myself on time is set myself a little alarm because I can really, really talk. Um, so, you know, early on, uh, it, it can just be missed and, and how you ask it, you know, from a lack of experience and a lack of confidence. Um, you know, so one of the things you do need to do along the way, uh, it can be via email or, or, or in a meeting, um, you have to actually ask to invest. So sometimes it's like, you know, we're ready to, are we ready to progress to the next stage in your process? Or what are the next steps? Or, you know, can you outline your investment process so that I can ensure that, you know, we're really helping you, you know, with the process on your side? Um, maybe for your pre-seed, you might actually send a safe or a term sheet uh, to an investor to see if they'll sign it. Um, 
sometimes you might be saying, hey, Rachel's leading my round and we're just checking with our investor friends to see, you know, who else is in, you know, when, when you're sort of later on in the process. So you do need to get um, good at that and you do need to understand the type of round you're running, uh, the stage of your round and, and how to ask that question. Um, the next thing is getting introductions. I think Mark alluded to this before. A lot of you are going to want introductions from the Giant Warm Intro and you should be looking to these great leaders. Um, some of the best outcomes we've had in our um, history at Cake is introductions we've had. Uh, I remember this, the first start mate um, office hours I went to, I just couldn't believe the quality of the people that we met. And then, you know, we got introductions from that that went on to become very meaningful for us. So, you know, if you're looking for an introduction, be very specific if you can. Um, use the actual names of the people that you want to get introduced to and then provide um, an email intro to the mentor uh, or the investor so that they can then forward that on very easily. You want to make sure that the, the workload of the person you're asking is as low as possible uh, because they're all um, ridiculously busy people and it's just the right way to sort of um, behave when you're asking for that introduction. Um, now, asking for advice as well, a lot of you will be wanting advice and, and it is great to get advice. Um, remember though, that you're always pitching. So even if you're not pitching, <laughs> you're always pitching. It's a weird one. It's something I've learned over time. The investors always look at you thinking, is this founder thoughtful? Are they smart? Can they solve this problem? Have they done their research? Um, so show that you've, you've really come into the situation as strong as possible, but you're looking for advice in key areas, which is very normal, especially if it's you know, aligned to this person's expertise. Um, you do have to realize a little bit, though, that most investors don't have a lot of time. Um, they're going to be seeing tons of pitches, doing a deal is extremely time consuming. Um, and, you know, they might be on boards as well. So you do have to sort of balance your expectation of what you can ask for. Um, and getting advice under those circumstances is really tricky. Uh, investors are very, very good at investing and they're very good at analyzing an investment, but they may, might not have expertise in your particular niche. So just be smart about the types of questions that you ask investors as well, um, advice wise. Um, now, the next one's about finding the right investors. And especially early on, this can be tricky. Um, you know, it's hard to know what you're supposed to try and learn from the investor and why. Like, you know, um, it can feel very one sided as if the investor has all the power. And um, certainly that's not the case. There's definitely uh, you need a balanced relationship as possible. The reason, so one of the key questions that you should ask, if you, and sometimes you can see this on, on their website, if they're a VC or on their LinkedIn, but what have they been investing in? You know, you're trying to find alignment on the stage of company you are and the niche that you're in. Are they active as well? Some investors won't be investing very much and some investors are very active. So it's really important to try and understand those things. You know, how many investments are they doing per year is, is a reasonable question to ask. Um, and then, you know, do they like a board seat? You know, it's, it's um, you know, again, you know, the the giant warm intro is just one meeting and you sort of, in most cases, going to treat it like a first meeting. So you might not ask all these questions in a first meeting, but with many of the investors that I've met, they'll normally give you an introduction of them and their fund or how they invest and, and their mandate. And then that's a really nice thing to get because it really helps you understand them better and see whether they're going to be a good fit for you. So do they have a, do they like a board seat? Um, do they lead investments or do they only follow? Is there a minimum percentage of your cap table that they need to invest? So some investors will need 10% minimum. I think that's normally around the number. So if you're doing a $5 million round, they need half a million dollars of that. Oh, sorry, if you're a $5 million post money company, they need to get 500K in there to get their minimum. So it, it is nice to know those things and you might want to use the giant warm intro for this or you might want to, to do that in your other meetings um you know do you invest in a safe or a con note or whatever instrument that you you're looking to raise sometimes there's exclusions around those sorts of things um another area that's really important to ask the right questions is um moving your round along so you'll all be at different stages some of you right at the beginning in the preparation phase some of you think you know some of you are prepared and raising some of you might already have a lead or a term sheet or something right so you're all going to be at different stages but um, it can be really tricky to work out when you move from the preparation phase to the actual raising phase that I call the marketing phase when you're having all your meetings and you're really pitching and pushing for, for getting that lead investor. Um, and 
what I advocate normally doing is when you're in the preparation phase, have some really good investors and advisors with you, at least one, if not a couple, and then you're looking for triggers from them that give you an indication that you're ready to really go and raise. Um, so for example, they, you, that you might ask them if you're ready to raise, you might ask them if they would invest or if they would lead. Um, you might ask them if they would introduce you to their network because if they're gonna introduce you to their investor friends, they're much more likely to do that when you're really ready because you know quite often they've got their, their reputation at stake. So knowing how to sort of get good people around you and then ask them those questions so that then you really feel like you are ready to go and run your raise means your whole raise is gonna be much more successful. Um, and then some questions that are really hard to ask. Um, yeah, what have you been investing in? We talked about that. Um, another way that you can sort of, you know, if, if you get to the end of your first meeting uh, and you could you do this in the giant warm intro, definitely. You say, look, if you're not raising right now, you could say, look, we're, we'll be raising soon. Um, would you like us to let you know when we're ready? Um, and, you know, would you like to participate? You're not saying, would you like to invest, but would you like to participate in the round? And these direct questions can be quite difficult, but what that allows you to do is sort of qualify the investor to um, you know, be part of your round when the time comes. And you wanna try and have as many qualified investors that know you, that have seen your deck, that have built a little bit of trust with you before you go and ask them for money, right? So before you really run that marketing part of your round. Um, another question you can ask, probably not for this, you know, giant warm intro, but, you know, asking the investors to, you know, give you some founders to talk to it is probably further down the track in your round, um, just to make sure that you're going to have a good relationship with these investors. Um, a lot of the investors are, will be passive, but certainly your lead investor, and certainly if they're going to have a board seat, you want to make sure you're going to have a great relationship uh, because you're going to be going through a lot together, um, you know, over, over five to 10 years. Um, a couple of other questions that came up. So building longer term relationships um, with investors. Um, I think it's really smart that you ask an investor if you feel like they're well aligned, if you can add them to your monthly update, as Mark um, alluded to, we're big advocates of monthly updates. Um, we think that it helps you build trust with the investor. They can see what you're trying to solve and they can see your progress over time. And, you know, they might just be looking at your updates. They might not always be engaging, but it's really great if you can get some engagement back from your investors um, as well along the way. Um, another question we had was around mentor whiplash. So, um, you know, you might get different information back from the investors that you talk to. And as a founder, um, you're constantly getting advice, especially if you're in good networks. Um, what I normally advocate is to, you know, go into the session um, with specific areas that you want to talk about. It could be growth, it could be capital raising, it could be product market fit, it could be something to do with, you know, a particular customer or, or a partner, but really be really, really specific about what you think the most important thing is uh, that you can ask about. And um, it's important to note that many investors, again, as I said before, they might have a limited understanding of your exact problem solution, but they're very skilled at investing and analyzing investments. So be, be flexible where appropriate. Um, and be firm to where it makes sense. Um, always have a learning mindset, but where you're an expert, express that. Make sure that you're solid um, and that your position is growing over time. And if you have the ability to educate the investor on the call, um, you know that's that's probably a good thing as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jace. I think, you know, the, the whole purpose of the Giant Warm Intro is really to start building those investor relationships and building them early. Um, so it's it really... Like, you know, a, a few questions have come up in the chat about, you know, who am I matched with and, and do we get to nominate? Um, effectively, we do try and go through a process where we match you with um, investors who are the right investors for your stage or for the type or sector of business that you are operating. Um, but we're not going to get it perfectly. And, and I'm definitely not committing to matching you with the investor that's going to invest in your round. I wish I was that good. Oh, come um, on. So I did do it once, <laughs> once last year. One person from the Giant Moment Show got an investment from who at least one that I know of, um, which I'm very proud of. Um, but effectively, you know, all the investors are here really to kind of, you know, make an introduction. And as, um, you know, Mark, Rach and Jace all said, it's really just that first introduction, which can then amplify and lead you to your next one. So 
to be honest, even if it's an investor you've met before, I actually think that's a great opportunity to have, you know, an open discussion, say, hey, you know, we've met before, you've pitched, I pitched to you before, you said no for this reason, like, can I chat about that a bit more and understand how I could communicate, you know, why, like, I don't believe what you, why you passed on us is, is at all right for our business. I'd love to, you know, dig into why you thought that and what I didn't communicate um, about my business to you to make you think that or what I could have said to get you excited. Um, Cause you'll tend to find, you know, if, if you're not the right investment for a fund, um, as Jay said, we're super busy and we might kind of give you a one line email saying, thanks, but you're not quite right for us. And this is why, but we don't, we honestly don't have the opportunity to say, you know, give a deep, detailed answer to that we'd love to um but this is a good opportunity to say hey you said our you know market size isn't big enough it's huge how can i explain better to the next next investor i talk to that it's huge um as well so in terms of matching i'm currently doing that it's very manual i'm doing my best um your comms will all be communicated on monday with who you're matched with um but yeah i really do think um the main thing is to have a warm introduction with an investor and utilize that warm introduction to get you to that next introduction um as i think once again everyone said ask the person you're talking to hey maybe i'm not quite right for your mandate but who do you think does invest in this space or who are the best education investors in the space or who actually is writing checks in Web3, for example, because we all do um, hang out together and, and do know kind of who's looking for what um, as well. So yeah, we're all here to help facilitate you to the introduction, um, which will hopefully be the one that um, is the investor who invests in you, um, but I'm not committing to delivering that um, on the giant warm intro. Um, Another question was, what information will they have? I think the best, like they have, they will have your, all the information that you put forward in your application, the investors receive that. Um, but I wouldn't um, recommend you rely on investors having read it or prepped for it. Um, so, you know, that's why your, you know, quick introduction at the beginning, elevator pitch, this is my business. Um, you know, a bit of, bit of detail at the beginning will help get the investors up to scratch on what they need to know about you. Um, and you'll also be able to share your slides of your pitch deck through the AirMeet process. If you don't have slides, absolutely no worries at all. You don't need to have them, but they can be a helpful resource. I'm not gonna lie, I'm probably a bit more visual. So when a founder shows me slides, I get very excited, um, but other people just wanna chat to you and, and don't use the slides. Um, so it's good to have, but definitely don't rely on it. Um, I think, Rach, I might throw it over to you. Oh, sorry, what I was going to say is I think VC is a bit like of a minefield in terms of what are VC investors actually looking for? Like, what should I be including in my pitch deck? All that kind of stuff. So if you want to use your 30 minutes just to ask and understand VC better, if you don't have that, you know, person in your network, you can say, you know, explain what a equity crowdfunding is, explain what an angel syndicate is, explain what early stage investing is. Hopefully, like Mark said, you've done some research, but you might come with some, you know, more detailed questions. You know, I understand this about angel syndicates. Is that more appropriate for me than a VC at this stage or not? And come with some good pointed questions. Um, but a great question, um, Rachel, which I might throw to you is um, in the chat about Cam, how big does TAM need to be? I was just reading that one. Oh, great. I was just reading that one. So um, as the astute question as, asker pointed out, like it is somewhat dependable on context, which isn't a fun answer to be like, how long is a piece of string? Um, but here's a good way to think about it. A VC wants every company, let's imagine we want a company to be a billion dollar plus business, right? If you're a SaaS company, the old multiples, who knows what the multiples are now, but let's call it you're trading on a 10x multiple, which means for a company to be worth a billion dollars, let's just say that you have revenue then of a hundred million, okay? So if you have revenue of a hundred million, what share of the market do you have in order to get that revenue? And so a hundred million is either a very big slice, i.e. the whole pie of a hundred million dollar market, or it's a small slice of a really freaking big market. That's 10 billion. So what I care less about is how big it is. What I care about is also how it's composed. Is this a winner takes all market? So if it's a winner takes all, then I need to believe that first of all, that TAM 
is sizable and you're going to take the whole freaking thing. If I believe that's a highly fragmented market and you only need to have two or three percentage points of market share, then you show me that that's a huge, huge, huge freaking market. So it depends. And those are the two levers that I, we think about. Ideally, it's not just large, but it's also growing. So I'm looking at Kager as well. And that's where that timing or that trends come in, where it's not just a big market now, but like, oh, wait, it's getting bigger. Like, tell me why demand for this product or um, experience with this pain is going to get bigger and bigger, and bigger. Like, um, this is a bad, sad example, but like diabetes, like that's only getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's gr like, you show me what the TAM is now and then show me what the growth rate is um, for people who will be diagnosed with diabetes. Rich, um, there's one other that I think is a super important question that you said you'd like to answer, um, which is around how much flexibility do investors expect with a raise ask um, and do they expect to be able to negotiate? Yeah, so usually, um, well, it depends if you're in the lead position or the follow position. So um, if you are looking for me to lead, then that's going to be a conversation. You can start with what your expectation is for how much you want to raise and um, what you think that valuation is. Uh, as I think it was Jason was talking about, different funds have different requirements for how much they need to own. Um, but VC maths are kind of, they work backwards, which is how much money do we need you to have to get to your next milestone? And then with that money, what is reasonable of a chunk of a company for you to sell to us? And then we build up the valuation from there. So there is flexibility. On the other hand, um, if you come to us and you're like, hey, Rachel, we want a 500K check to finish out our 3.5 million round, and we already have 3 million committed, and these are the terms, like those are the terms. I'm either signing them or not. I don't have my own term sheet against that. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Um I think just to, to sum it up, I think hopefully everyone's got some really helpful um, prep advice ahead of the session. I'll just reiterate, um, you know, at the end of the, the session, if you've enjoyed the conversation with the investor, please do ask them for their email address, say, you know, can I keep you updated with my monthly updates? Or, you know, can I maybe send you a few emails afterwards to ask to be connected to another investor that's participating in the giant warm intro? Um, or just keep those communication lines open um, would be my biggest piece of advice. Um, I think, yeah, more than ever, just given the challenging raise environment, um, building long-term relationships and, and showing people your progress on your journey is super important. Um, and we really do hope that the giant warm intro is that first step um, on your fundraising journey or on your startup journey. Um, and, and it's, you know, an, an opportunity for you to, to take the introduction um, and make the most of it, um, which is the aim. So just a, a quick reminder, You'll get a heap of comms on Monday, who you're matched with, what time, air, air meet link. Um, so that's all coming on Monday. After that, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to um, our wonderful organizer, Alicia. Um, you already got a few emails from her, but alicia at rampersand.com for any questions you have um, after you get all your comms on Monday. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we you know, really hope you enjoyed the session and they're excited about the giant warm intro. Huge thanks to Mark, Rachel and Jason for all your insights and for Cal for organizing us and bringing us all together today. Um, and a quick reminder, if you are a Sydney founder um, and you would like to join the drinks that AWS, Cake and Air Wallex are running after the event, um, there is a link earlier, but I will post it again, just in case. Um, but yes, thank you all so much for joining. Rach, Mark, Ace, Cal, thank you so, so much for your advice.